Okay, unpopular opinion, but students will love learning if they have less homework. <laughs> In the school that I went to as a kid, I don't think I remember ever having homework until year four, maybe. What? May I, I remember <laughs> one, there was one piece of <laughs> <Person>. one. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Big Brain Energy, a show that highlights the lives of Malaysians who have impacted the country through their work in different fields. In this mini-series, we'll be highlighting these three topics in particular. Research and advancement in health, education and climate emergencies. Yeah, today's episode though, uh, a little bit special. First, we'll be speaking with Chan Soon Seng, the CEO of Teach for Malaysia, about the organization's work in changing the landscape of Malaysian education. And after that, we'll speak to Nadia Izzedin, the head of Merdeka Award Trust, about the trust's work in fostering a culture of excellence through its main programs, the Merdeka Award as well as the Merdeka Award Grant for International Attachments. That's going to be interesting uh, because we'll be asking her for tips about applying for the grant for international attachment. So if you're looking for some funding for a short stint at Harvard, MIT or other institutions, do stay tuned till the end of the episode for that segment. Okay, so let's get into it. Actually, Sun Singh, can you just do a quick introduction of yourself and maybe teach for Malaysia for us before we jump into the game? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, first off, thanks so much for having me here on the no show. Um, so my name is Sun Seng. I am the CEO of Teach for Malaysia. And I started off my journey in education with Teach for Malaysia um, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, just over 10 years ago as a teacher, as a fellow in our first cohort. And I taught, uh, I was an English teacher in secondary school in a high need school in Selangor. Mm -hmm. And that's a brief, brief intro uh, about myself. And Teach from Malaysia is an organization with a vision to ensure that every child in Malaysia has access to quality education. We want to ensure that every child, no matter what their background, has the education that enables them to realize their potential and end up living a life that they truly love. We have two core programs, the Teach for Malaysia Fellowship, mm -hmm. which focuses on bringing people from outside the education system. So uh, fresh graduates, young professionals who really want to make a change in education, and they're then placed into Ministry of Education schools for two years. Our second uh, core program is a program that we run uh, for Yayasan Patronas, where we work with taking all the lessons from our flagship fellowship program. We then work with in-service STEM teachers so mm. teachers who have been teaching in the system for a while and we want to then enable them to upskill themselves to be able to be effective STEM teachers. So it's also a two-year program where they get training, coaching uh -huh. and support. Uh -huh. cool. Okay. We got the right guy. We right did, right? Yeah, right? he can talk, right? <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay, so we'll play the game. <laughs> yeah, let's play the game. Okay, so it's called the unpopular opinion, but so basically if you agree with something, thumbs up. Yep. Don't agree with something, Thumbs down. Got it. Got it? Got okay, it. do you want to start us off? Is there like a middle option? Uh, Maybe we can just do that. Yeah, I, I But try that. not to try not to be in the middle. Okay. Okay. Okay, we, should we start? <laughs> yeah. Private schools always offer better education than public government schools. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, why do you why do you Yeah, say I mean that? I, I definitely I think it's true that top performing private international schools uh, generally outperform uh, even some of the highest performing government schools. But mm -hmm. the reality is that there are actually also many private schools um, that aren't necessarily performing better than a government school. So okay. it's really important that I think when a parent is making a decision about where they send their kids to school to not make that automatic assumption. Just right. don't go because the name seems yeah. fancy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, okay, it's easier to get into good universities if you have the right connections slash prominent family name. Well, that's controversial. Three, two, one. <laughs> yeah. Your turn, why do you think that? No, I think privilege is privilege is privilege, you know? Like, yeah, I don't know how to explain better than that. Can you? Yeah, well, I mean, I think also a, re a reality is that there 
are so in Malaysia, we're kind of privileged to have so many options for tertiary education. Mm. But the reality is that many kids going through the public school system are just unaware of the options that are available. Mm. Yeah, that's and I true. think that there is not enough support that's provided to kids who are making a decision about what they want to do mm. uh, after school. Mm. And you hear the story lots of times, right? Like, I, I knew of this schooling option because I had a friend that did that or a family member or someone that enabled me to get uh, to that position. Mm. If you talk about, like, the really, really, like, if we're talking about Ivy Leagues and if we're talking about, I mean, I think... Uh, uh, less about the family name, more so about the kind of privilege that it needs to be able to be even be prepared to apply to a school like yeah. that. Yeah. Punishment now. Um, <laughs> caning should still be considered an acceptable method to discipline students. Ooh. Definitely not. No. No Definitely way. Not. No. I, I yeah. And I think it's still, a, it's, it's a very controversial topic and I think there are many Malaysians who would, who would still believe that caning is acceptable. I think that many people um, went through a school system that where they experienced that. And mm. It was a norm, right? It was a norm. Was yeah. it a norm yeah. even for you as well? No, not for me, no. It, for it, it had gone away by the time I left school, just. Yeah. Okay. And so oftentimes one of the misconceptions in, in education is if it worked for me, then it should work for, for kids now right. uh, and, and it should be fine, right? But I think that this is definitely something that we need to advocate to move away from mm. as wholesale because it's still prevalent in the school system and is enabled, uh, is allowed to happen in some contexts. Mm. So I, I definitely think it's something we have to move away from completely. Yeah, positive reinforcements. Absolutely. Better than... Mm -hmm. yeah. And not to say that consequences aren't real and that we can't talk about healthy discipline, mm -hmm. um, but without the physical abuse. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, unpopular opinion, but students will love learning if they have less homework. Mm, three, two, one. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> You're <laughs> taking oh. <laughs> um, You know, I think that, that homework has to serve a huge purpose right uh -huh. if it's not me uh, all at the end of the day learning always has to goes back to uh, goes back always has to go back to this idea of is it meaningful for a child right and so um i didn't in the school that i went to as a kid i don't think i remember ever having homework until year four maybe what? May, I, I remember <laughs> one there was one piece of <laughs> <Person>. one <laughs> <laughs> the one homework that I do remember before year four was like I had to plant bean sprouts in this uh -huh. cotton oh thing. Oh my god, I did too. It puts me off bean sprouts forever. <laughs> um, I hate that game. <laughs> but I think that if you compare it to the amount of homework that kids are getting today yeah. or often in, in the Malaysian education system from a very young age, I don't know that there's much of a benefit. Um, so I think at the end of the day, it's about how meaningful the work is. So if you're just getting a whole pile of like worksheets that you have to go home and kind of mm. memorize mm. stuff or copy mm. answers into and the uh, learning isn't meaningful, then, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah. I think. Is there something we can tie in with parents to this as well? Do you think that, because a lot of parents have come with this idea of like, my kid isn't learning enough. I'd like mm -hmm. him to have more, ho him mm. or her to have more homework. They're doing piano lessons, they're doing something else. And then, is it, would you see that as well as part of the problem? I wouldn't say problem necessarily, but I would say that, you know, fair enough, like as, as a parent, you know, you've been educated in a certain way and you believe that that's what works for you yeah. and you believe that that's how, it, how you learned and yeah. you would want to then see that, right? And so it may perpetuate that in certain, uh, in certain instances. Mm. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, like a huge part of what an effective education is, is about the communication that happens between all of the parties involved, right? Yeah. So between mm. a teacher, a child, and also the family as well. Mm. And the more that a family understands what's going on with their kids' education, um, the more they're then going to be able to understand that it's not just about the amount of homework and amount of time a right. child is spending right. um, on learning. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I said no, actually, because um, as we have established, I have attention issues. So I need to be told to sit down and like focus mm. and then only I'll get into it. So it was something that maybe I'd say I kind of needed to just refocus my, my thoughts and yeah. my time into something that I have to do yeah. or else I'd just be like, ah, yeah. Oh well, I mean, I don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that no homework yeah. situation, right? But mm. I think like a healthy amount of homework, because I think that if you look at the amount of pressure that kids um, are under today and the amount of time that kids... So I think that the, the thing that we have to account for is that kids 
are probably spending even more time academic or in their studies, doing homework, going for extra tuition classes. Yeah. But that's not necessarily translating into learning outcomes. Yeah. And that's what we have to question, right? Mm. Why are our kids spending more time but not learning as much? Yeah. Mm. So homework is not a bad thing, but yeah. we've just got to make sure that it's meaningful and actually driving the discipline as yeah. well, <laughs> uh, the self-study habits, mm. but it's purposeful, right? And not just adding on homework because Correct. We think more homework's gonna. Right. Yeah, and right. then they better. get punished as well if they don't do it right. That's bad. Um, okay, so local policy makers who send their own kids to private slash boarding school tend to not have much trust in the Malaysian education system. That oh. is. Ooh, mm. I don't know. <laughs> do I have a say in this? I'm going with that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to answer. <laughs> I plead the fifth. I don't know. Like, you feel like you're gonna get in trouble? No, not that. I don't know if I know enough to comment on this. How yeah. many times have we read about or learned about some minister and their kids being stu uh, studying overseas? You know, and we've, yeah. we've heard about their kids are overseas. And then there's so many questions that we have amongst us, the public, as mm. to why is that continually happening? Why are they spending all of this money to, spend, to send their kids over school? Abroad, why yeah. can't they study at home? I think mm. it's a debate we should be talking about. Yes, you know, definitely. We should, I don't think it's something we should be afraid of oh. voting yes or no <laughs> for. Oh. You know, yeah. And I think it's ah. also not to say that all ministers don't trust the public right. education yeah. system. Right. Actually, a lot of the, the more recent education ministers have sent their kids through the public school system. Right. So it's not to say that not all of them trust or don't trust the system. Kay. Okay. Bob? I think we're done with these now, right? Yeah. Let's what put it what away. would you say then is is both the best and the worst thing about being an educator? Mm. Oh. Um, I think the best thing about being an educator. So I was a teacher 10 years ago. I taught for two years. Molding little and minds. <laughs> <laughs> but to, it, it's to hear m from my students today the difference that, you know, the, the lessons that we experienced together have made for them right. um, and where they're at today, mm. right? And so I think that there is this long-term kind of uh, gratification that you have as, as an educator that you definitely don't experience in the short term. Mm. Um, but uh, there's something really, really special about knowing that, you know, you played some part in making a difference in someone's life. Yeah. But in the short term as an educator, no matter how challenging, and it can be extremely challenging to be an educator, but no matter how challenging it was or the day was or a lesson was, I always ended the day knowing that at least that I was contributing to something that was quote unquote very corny, making the world a better place, right? Aww. Or making a difference in other people's lives. lives yeah. The most difficult thing that I experienced and I think that um, educators in general experience are really the, the negative ideologies that people have around kids. So I think that one of the most damaging things that a child can experience or even as an educator to, to constantly hear is like, oh, these kids aren't good enough mm. or kids from this community or mm. this background. Yeah can't do it or you know oh don't don't believe so much in those kids mm. um because you know they, they they don't have the they're not just smart enough right and i think that that can be some of the most difficult things to hear because the reality is that that kind of rhetoric is actually very prevalent yeah whether it's in the school system or even just in society in general and as an educator that's something that you constantly have to to fight against ideologically mm. Mm. kind of related to that like um we did some research on your background yeah. And you once said that you actually joined Teach for Malaysia because of the discrimination or inequality that your brother and yourself face, right? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the inequality, I, um, I was very privileged to, to go to um, a very good international school mm. uh, in Malaysia. And it was very expensive and... In 1997, um, mm. during the Asian financial crisis, my father lost his job yeah. and kind of never really recovered financially. And eventually I had to end up uh, dropping out of school um, after year nine and uh, realizing that money um, had this big influence on mm. the kind of quality of education that I could receive personally. Yeah. And um, my brother, who's 15 years younger than me, then went through the public education system. And as he was going through public school, I just noticed the massive, massive 
disparity in the mm. kind of education that he was receiving, right? And I just felt that it was completely unfair that just because someone or just because I grew up uh, in a background where we had money, money to be able to afford a different kind of education, that I could receive what I what I experienced as a quote unquote better education. Yeah. And so that kind of really, really frustrated me and made me, it just made me feel really angry that, you know, my brother couldn't receive the kind of education that I did just because we couldn't afford it, right? Mm. Um, so that was sort of what initially really got me interested in, in education and teach from Malaysia, but I had never in my life thought that I would ever become a teacher or work in education. Why? Why do you think that? I just, <laughs> I just didn't think that it just wasn't something that interested me oh. in the past. Um, and I think that the disparities that I saw between my brother and I just got me so frustrated that I was like, I want to do something about this. Mm. And instead of just being frustrated about it, I want to contribute. Mm. Um, and Teach from Malaysia was perfect because it was like just not just, but at the time it was like just two years of your life, which is, I understand, a very long time. But um, just two of your years of your life, you can make a meaningful impact and a mm. meaningful difference in the education system and the lives of your students and then feel like I would contribute and do my part. Mm. Mm. But the reality was the two years significantly impacted me, changed, changed my life. life, changed the way that I saw the world and 10 years plus on, I'm still in education. Nice. Okay, I've got a question for both of you again. Um, if you were an education minister for a term, what would you do? What, was, what would be the first thing that you'd do? I'll let you go first. Yeah, you should go first, actually. <laughs> so I find these questions really hard because I think that the, the job of the minister of education is really, really complex. Yeah, it's Probably harder than many, many, many other ministers' uh, jobs, right? Mm. And so I, I always think that there's there's like absolutely no one sing single silver bullet that's going to be the best thing ever to do, yeah. right? But I think that um, as the Minister of Education, probably the first thing would be just listening. Mm. Um, I think one of the challenges in the education system is that when you have all of these... Uh, leadership that is tied to the political cycle of five years mm. um, that can be very un uh, unsettling for the system. And the reality is that the, the education system works in 11 to 12 year cycles, right? And so if you come, you have somebody coming in halfway all the time, kind of disrupting with new policies, um, that can be very disruptive. So I would just listen and I would be uh, um, really open to understanding what are the existing policies? What are the challenges that teachers face? Listening to teachers directly, listening to students directly, mm. Mm. Um, and the community and uh, civil society organizations mm. as well. I think I try and get some kind of syllabus implemented that is sustainable for a lengthy period of time, you know, five, six, seven years mm -hmm. with changes and tweaks as, as you go along. But it's a very similar thing to what you're suggesting, you know, you need it to be in place mm. for a regular amount of time and not be disruptive to the kids who are at the school. Because yeah. I remember being at school and halfway through we'd switch from O levels to GCSE. Mm -hmm. And for kids who were in their fourth and fifth year, we were just like, what's going on and how do we deal with it? even the teachers were just like we're really sorry we know it's disruptive right. stick with us but having that you know length of time and that yeah something like that but uh, uh, we should probably ask uh, who would have as deputy oh yeah that's your turn who would no, you have yeah, um, no i have no answers answer. for this no, no, no. <laughs> it's for him to answer. <laughs> I, w I won't give a name, right? But I, Why not? <laughs> I, I would, but I would tell you who I wouldn't pick. I wouldn't pick another politician. That's a good right? uh, I would pick someone who has a background in education, mm, who has leadership yeah. experience in education. That's definitely what I would do. If you had a Teach from Malaysia in. alumni, potentially. <laughs> good enough, good enough. Right. So you, you talked about the experience that your brother had uh, and yourself in the public school system. What are the inequalities that, that stood out for you then? Yeah, I think that what I personally, so I think observing my brother's education experience, I had a lot of assumptions about what was quote unquote going wrong mm -hmm. uh, with his education, right? So I think the first thing was like looking at uh, his experience of school, it was very stressful, right? Mm -hmm. And But he was also really struggling to learn in the classroom. So my first assumption was that, oh, you know, maybe his teachers aren't 
that good, right? Mm -hmm. Either they're 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 just like lazy, or they're just um, not great at not great at teaching, right? Because mm -hmm. why isn't he learning? Because he would come home, have no idea how to do his homework, this yeah. pile of homework, and I would sit with him, and he would figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, so I don't think you're the problem, yeah. um, but there's something going uh, wrong in school, right? And mm -hmm. I would, so I, I my initial assumption was that I would just blame like the teachers, right? And I think that then becoming a teacher myself afterwards what I realized was actually there are so many passionate brilliant Malaysian educators that are out there but oftentimes what is happening is that their hands are so tied yeah. by the challenges that they experience in the system so at Teach from Malaysia we we think of three sort of things that um, uh, that are enabling inequalities in the country so um, number one we think about the idea of socioeconomic factors right and so it's this idea that you know kids from low-income backgrounds have less of an opportunity to receive of a quality education simply because they can't afford it. Public education is free in Malaysia, mm. but you have to pay for uniforms, you have yeah. to pay for stationaries. Yeah. Kids don't success, oftentimes don't successfully make it through the system if they don't have extra classes outside of school, yeah. which you have to pay for, right? So even though public education is free, socioeconomic factors still are a huge issue. The yeah. second thing we think about is um, uh, systemic factors, right? So teachers in Malaysia are tied or obligated to teach the Malaysian education curriculum at the level that a kid is in. Mm -hmm. And so for example, if you are in form three, and you are struggling to, to meet the Form 3 uh, syllabus. syllabus, a teacher is obligated legally to teach that syllabus. Right. So they can't adjust the curriculum to meet your needs. Mm. Oh, oh, I mean, they can, right? But um, uh, what, what they are sort of, what's sort of ingrained in teachers to, be, to believe is that they have to deliver the syllabus. Yeah. There are also challenges of the ways in which we used to rank kids and uh, according to classes, according to their academic level, right? Mm. So you do an exam and kids who perform the best get put in the A class and yeah. kids who um, don't perform academically well, they get put in the last class. Mm. The ministry has changed that. That is no longer the way that things operate, but it's still an embedded way in which um, uh, kids still get sorted in the system. Yeah. And that then systemically then sets certain kids up for more success than others. So you have kids in your first class who have access to all of the opportunities. Sometimes they get all the, be the best teachers in the class. Yeah. And then you have kids in the quote unquote terrible, terrible term the last class who are just seen as kids that are less intelligent mm. and maybe we shouldn't try as hard with those kids and we should just focus on on these kids that are gonna get the get the A's mm. um, and then the third thing that we think about uh, that uh, that entrenches in, uh, inequalities is this pr the, this idea of prevailing ideologies. So this belief that kids from low income families, um, you know, they just need to work harder. Yeah. Um, they're just they they're just not as motivated. Um, they're and, or, or kids from a certain type of ethnic background. They're actually there's a belief that some kids are just genetically not as smart right. as yeah. other kids. Right. And so when we think about inequalities, we think about these factors that entrench uh, these inequalities in the system. Mm -hmm. And so then. My experience, you know, these assumptions that I have about what's wrong with the system, then becoming a teacher and actually experiencing the system for myself really, really changed the way that I saw um, uh, what the problems were. Mm. Um, saw, yeah, the way that I saw the problems in the system and that they're a lot more deep rooted um, than we think that, uh, based on what we see on the surface yeah. level. But but like in your with your experience, how do you think then we can equalize the playing field? Let's let's just say your second example of like how we're divided according to our intelligence per se. How can this be equalized? Yeah, you know, I think ultimately at the end of the day, and the thing that Teach from Malaysia is all about, right, is about leadership. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Teach from Malaysia, for example, is not going to train enough teachers to be able to change the, uh, the, the practice of every teacher in the country. There are 420,000 teachers yeah. in the system. And Teach from Malaysia has <laughs> trained uh, 474 fellows, right, out yeah. of the 420,000 teachers in the system. But what we believe is that if we enable teachers to have the mindsets and the leadership competencies to be able to 
make the changes that they need to see in their classrooms and in the system, mm -hmm. that that is the thing that's going to be able to shift systems. So what we often see now is that teachers aren't empowered and they feel like they're boxed in mm -hmm. by all of the policies and regulations that cause them to operate in a certain way um, or they were trained in a certain way, right? And so what we believe needs to happen is that we need to develop and empower more leaders across every level of the system who are going to take risks, who are going to have a vision for their students and for the schooling system that is beyond uh, what was delivered to them or that they're boxed into mm -hmm. and then to be able to take the risks to deliver on that and to influence those around them to be able to uh, to work towards that alternate vision mm -hmm. and to be able to then sustain efforts towards uh, towards a vision for change because that never happens overnight. Yeah. I mean, you've spoken about the, these teachers, you know, being empowered and being made leaders and creating uh, good leadership. Mm -hmm. Have you got some like examples of, of, of these schools that have, yeah. you know, somebody's been brought in, they've been made into a leader, they've been given the opportunity to do it. Yeah. Do you have any examples? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that first, the first thing to say about, about leadership, the kind of leadership that we need in the education system is that it has to, it's never about the strongman leadership. It's never about right. this one guy that comes in or a principal that comes in that changes everything and um, uh, and then everything is changed forever, right? Yeah. And actually more often uh, than not, what we've seen is strong principals who come in, um, turn things around, but once they leave, it's an unsustainable change right. and things right. revert back. Mm. So the kind of leadership that we believe we need to see in the education system is, is a is a collective kind of leadership where you have leadership at every level that is enabling sustainable change. So mm. the, the places where we've seen the best kind of transformation is where you've got leadership at the, the school leadership at the top, middle leadership, and then teachers themselves feeling empowered mm -hmm. to make change uh, in the system. Mm -hmm. So an example that uh, I'll, I'll give you is um, Teach from Malaysia in the past run, ran a program called the GUSTO program, which stands for ground up school transformation. And what that program did was it worked with um, the school principals, middle leaders in the schools and teachers to then think about, to think about how they would uh, change their teaching practice. Mm -hmm. And what we saw, uh, what, what we then, why it was called ground up was we took the form one teachers and they, they were trained, then they went, uh, went up to form, uh, teach form two and then they had to teach the form one teachers um, the new oh. pedagogy that they had uh, that they had learnt and so it was then embedded into the school and the school teachers were the ones uh, delivering that training themselves with the support of their principals and middle leaders and that's when we were able to see like really significant school school-wide transformation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we ran that prog uh, program in five, uh, five schools in uh, Perak and Penang um, oh. back in 2015. Um, but basically all that to say that if we want to see true transformation in the system, it has to be collective yeah. and it has to be um, every level. people at every level mm. working together. Mm. Got it. Yeah, okay, so just earlier you touched on how teachers aren't really empowered because they have to work within certain margins, right? So to say the system's not very good at training or retaining teachers or like empowering them with things that they can transfer to their students. Were there like some ways, like what can the system do to train and retain teachers better? The, so there's McKinsey um, in their education research has this uh, phrase that the quality of an education system can never exceed the quality of its teachers. Mm -hmm. So Malaysia has done significant uh, or has made significant investments into ensuring that um, we have uh, physical universal access to education in Malaysia. All kids, um, when, when we're not in a COVID situation, can rock up to a school and can access education, right? Yeah. And in, that, in, in our efforts to ensure that there was physical access to education, we then um, set up huge infrastructure to train teachers. Mm -hmm. And so we invest a lot in pre-service training uh, of educators in Malaysia, about half a billion ringgit every mm. year in pre-service training. Um, but the challenge that we have with that is that is that because education is a continuously changing um, affair, mm -hmm. what happens is that if we don't continuously educate um, our, our teachers, our educators, then they get left behind yeah. very, very quickly. Mm. Malaysia's budget per teacher annually for professional development is something to the tune of 
27 ringgit per teacher a year. So if you think about the kind of quality of teacher training, <laughs> continuous professional development that teachers are able to receive, mm -hmm. um, uh, there's just not the resourcing that enables teachers to keep up yeah. um, with, with the, the new methodologies, the new pedagogies, the new things that they need to engage in. Mm. So we significantly need to invest in uh, continuous professional development of teachers. So that's, that's part of also why, so Teach From Malaysia has then spent the last 10 years in ensuring that we have a new pipeline of really promising talent that comes into the system. But we've also then moved to ensure that we're working with teachers in the system themselves mm. to ensure that they have access to high quality, continuous professional development. Because mm. you can't just put in great talent in the beginning yeah. and not continue to support them across their lifetime in the system. 27 yeah. ringgit, I just, that that's insanity. Can I say one controversial thing? Go please, for it, well. say please, all please the do. controversial <coughs> things. Say, say it to the camera. And I, <laughs> I, I really believe in there are so many teachers that are passionate out there and there's we have so many great educators in Malaysia but we also need to ensure that we have just better performance management in our system mm. and so for teachers that aren't performing they either need the support or we need to have a way to exit the teachers that just aren't helping um, uh, or, or who are not receiving the support and changing their practice. Right. And so I think that if we truly, truly want a robust education system, mm. we need to support teachers across the chain of their professional development. And also for just for people that uh, it isn't working in any company, there are people that leave a company and any company, their performance management issues. Mm. You cannot tell me that with 420,000 people, there aren't performance management issues. But mm. the reality is that you don't, we don't have an exit policy or oh, there is an exit policy in paper, but not practiced. Um, and if we truly want to hold our system accountable, mm. we need to ensure that that. Uh, we that have to be place. honest with ourselves. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, uh, Okay. And that's not to negate or say that there are not amazing educators out there. There mm -hmm. are so many of them and we need to do a better job at supporting them yeah. as well. But like in any industry, there's a bell curve. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, th this new kind of crop of educators that are trying to implement, you know, innovation, new styles of teaching in the classroom. Um, what would you say is, is one of the things that you're very proud of, like implementing those ideas? Yeah. So I think one of the things that we're we're really, really proud of and what we believe needs to happen it, or shift in the education system is we, traditionally education in Malaysia, thank you British um, colonists, is um, a, a system of, <laughs> um, it's a colonial system, right? And it was designed in a way to, to get kids to memorize things so that they could you be- learn it by rote. Um, yeah. Rote and so that they would be able to toe the and line and, and oh um, God, deliver so on what our colonial masters wanted for, uh, for them, right? And so it's very top down in education. Yeah. And uh, anyone who's gone through our education system knows it's about memorizing the right answers and regurgitating the right answers, Correct. right? We believe that that needs to flip, right? Mm. And we believe that actually students need to be at the forefront of leading their learning mm. and um, discovering what they want to learn, discovering what they're passionate about, discovering learning for themselves and leading their own learning. And the role of an educator, which the Ministry of Education is trying to flip, is to be more of a facilitator of learning mm. than the, the teacher who is all wise and all knowledgeable and for you to there, therefore download knowledge from their brains, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the things that uh, we build into the way that we train our, our teachers and our fellows is how do we develop student leadership? And one of the examples of the ways in which uh, we've done that for, for 10 years is we run um, a student leadership camp. And mm -hmm. what we do is we get kids, uh, our, what our teachers will do is they get their kids to identify a problem in their schools or their communities, and they use a design thinking process to come up with a solution, um, to come up with a plan, they have to come up with a budget, they have to come up with an uh, implementation timeline, mm. and um, they then get funded to implement that uh, in, their, um, in their schools or in their communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen is that when kids have a real hands-on um, experience where they are applying their learning into a real life context, that they take ownership of that. Mm. And when they take ownership of that, they're going to learn all of the things that they need to learn to make that a reality, right? So an example of what we've seen kids do in the student leadership camp was there were these, a bunch of form one kids and they, the, they identified an issue in their community or mm. in their school, which was that they just hated using the toilet. 
And they hated using the toilet because it was vandalized all the time, right? right. So Aww. doors would be broken or like taps in the sink wouldn't be working. And so they felt it was really unsafe to use the toilet. So what they ended up doing is um, they ended up getting the kids in who, dis number one, they discovered who was vandalizing the toilet. Okay. They ended up getting the kids who vandalized the toilet to paint it and decorate it. Mm. And then they made them responsible for ensuring that uh, the toilet was clean the whole time or that was kept that way because they were the ones that had, that had painted it, right? Yeah. Um, and so they these kids then came up with this project. They, they made that happen. And then afterwards, the toilet was like in this working condition for um, whatever whatever amount of time. Oh. And so in that, you know, they had to learn how do they, um, how do they, First, they had to come up with that idea. They then had to influence these kids to be able to do that, mm. um, and then they had to they had to pitch this project, right? So they had to come up with a project name, pitch this project, get funding for it, mm. um, and then make sure that they implemented it and make uh, and ensure that there was maintenance over the long term for it. Cool. My school actually did a, like the same thing. Yeah. Uh, every classroom had two cubicles to ourselves, and we're in charge of keeping it clean, and it's always clean. That's yeah. a great idea. Cool. Yeah. So when you empower students yeah. to lead the solutions, it's very different to a teacher coming in and saying, hey, you need to make sure that this is, this is clean, right? Mm. Yeah. And so we believe that taking a student-centered approach um, where we're enabling students to lead their learning, uh, yeah. that that's um, the kind of shift we want to see happen in the system. Mm. And we're really, really proud to see pockets of that happen, um, but we want to see more. Much, so you, you want it to that. move across the whole of Malaysia? Yeah. Do you yeah. think it's On possible to do that? Scale? Absolutely. Do you Sorry. think it's possible? Do you think it's possible to do that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because I think that obviously we run this in the context, we run this approach in the context of our um, our program and with our teachers. Mm. But what we've seen is that um, when we open this up to uh, to teachers beyond our programs, that mm. they take it on. They're able to do it with their kids mm. yeah. as well. Um, there are constraints, obviously, with the way that subjects and timetables work in the in the, the regular academic calendar. So oftentimes this has to take place as a co-curricular activity, um, but it's definitely possible. All right, so what would you say are the three biggest things that requires change for children across Malaysia to have equal access to quality education? The three, the three biggest, yes. <coughs> three <laughs> biggest things. Um, three biggest things and they're not very, uh, they're not very easy things, right? So number one, um, it's very challenging, but we need to figure out the right balance of how do we decentralize power across the education system mm -hmm. to ensure that teachers and school leaders are able to operate more autonomously. And so part of the, the biggest challenge with our system is that it is very um, command and control. It's very um, hierarchical. And so a teacher often feels like they are bound by the policies mm -hmm. and um, what they believe. Uh, there's actually more freedom for teachers to operate, but they, they often believe that they have to just follow quote unquote orders from the top. Right. So how do we ensure the right balance of decentralization of power? So to your point about like a curriculum that mm. would last, mm. well, what we need to do is empower our teachers to be able to have flexibility to adapt the curriculum to their students' needs. Mm. Mm. But now a teacher doesn't feel like they have that autonomy. Mm. They feel like they must follow the curriculum that's in the textbook. Um, so if they don't have that autonomy, I'm not saying that we give everyone complete free reign, but the right level of autonomy, um, and so first decentralization. Mm. Um, so, and along decentralization, we need to give school principals the, the power to hire and fire their teachers. Right. No principal in Malaysia, or v uh, they, they don't get to pick their team. Imagine if you're a CEO of a company and you so cannot. So who does that? So it's a, f it's a federally assigned um, uh, operation. So teachers are recruited at the Ministry of Education And then level, distributed. Then distributed downwards. Oh, I, I, I did I not know that. I so the right level of decentralization uh, is the number uh, number one thing. Um, number two, we need to invest in, like I've been saying this whole time, right? Leadership and quality professional development for teachers. Mm. But number three is we really need to open up um, uh, the Ministry of Education to work with the community, to work with civil society organizations, to work with the public so that we can collectively, And because I think part of the challenge and what's also unfair to the ministry is, I think we just, 
expect that the Ministry of Education itself is going to take care of all of the problems to do with education. Right. But education is so much larger than that, and we mm. all need to work together to advance it. But the problem is that um, as the public, we feel the Ministry of Education has to take care of everything on its own. The yes. Ministry of Education often doesn't know how to reach out or utilize right. um, uh, what's available outside. And so number three, we definitely need to open up um, mm. Uh, how the Ministry of Education operates so that we can collectively uh, move forward. Mm. Okay, uh, so where would you put Mal the Malaysian education on the global scale and are we far from the global standards? Yeah, so the, the main metric that gets used to measure sort of global um, standards is uh, the PISA um, assessment by mm -hmm. the OECD. And so Malaysia has made progress on that. So the, currently in Malaysia, we have an education blueprint that was um, started in 2013 that will last until 2025. Our aspiration in that is to rank in the top third of mm -hmm. uh, PISA countries. So when we started the blueprint, we were in the bottom third. Um, and the good news is that we have made progress, right? So mm -hmm. in the last PISA um, rankings, Malaysia's moved up mm -hmm. into the middle third. Um, right. So three layers, right? So we've moved up into the middle third. Um, but the reality is that we're actually still below the OECD average mm -hmm. and we're very, very far behind our aspiration of being in the top third. So we're not at the, in, in the, in the, the worst, worst situation, right. but we're definitely far behind our aspirations. And if we look between, uh, I know it always feels unfair to compare Malaysia and Singapore, but the, the comparison has to be made. If we look between um, the the two systems mm -hmm. kids in malaysia and singapore go to school for the same amount of time but kids in malaysia according to the world bank end up three years behind kids in singapore oh. so if you want to compare against you know those those metrics we're not we're not in the worst situation but mm. we're definitely not where we want to be we could do better yeah okay so how does the merdeka award trust help an organization like tfm to spur it forward yeah you know i think that we are extremely, extremely proud and feel very, very privileged to be recognized uh, by the Merdeka Award Trust. Mm. The Merdeka Award, you know, I think is an award that really prioritizes um, people that or, or organizations that are driving um, solutions that are making Malaysia um, a better place, right? Mm. And to be recognized as an organization that's just over 10 years old, um, we are, we're very, very proud to be recognized uh, in that. And the Merdeka Award really, number one, it just elevates our profile as an organization mm -hmm. and it brings an awareness to what are some of the biggest issues and challenges that exist in the country and sheds mm. a spotlight on that and then also sheds a spotlight on the solutions. So for an organization like Teach from Malaysia, it really, number one, validates the work that we do mm. um, and uh, helps us to have recognition for the impact that we've made, but then also opens up doors for us to be able to do even more work because of that recognition. So we're very, very grateful um, for the Merdeka Award. Mm. Very quickly, if you were in education, mm. where do you think you'd be? What would you be doing? So I think about this sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that, um, so like I said, I never wanted to be an educator, mm -hmm. but now I can't, re I can't think of anything else that I'd rather be doing. But if I had to do something different, I might like work in a Disney theme park or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. Oh, no, 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 no. I would be, sorry. Disney. I would be um, a, a tour guide. Like, oh! I love making up random stories about places. I might not tell you the truth about uh -huh. a place, but, but it'd be interesting. What do you have mean? an entertaining tour. <laughs> right. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> be an alternative tour. And that's tour guide. Yeah. What a great idea. What a great idea. Okay. So, what is some of your favorite? Well, not story. A mantra that you keep with yourself to keep you motivated when the going gets tough. Oh. I don't know that I have like a particular a particular Thing like that you saying say or mantra, mm. but I think that what I hold on to is the stories of my students. Mm. And I think about how kids who have come 
against great odds, have figured out how to, to make it in the way that they wanted to make it in mm. life. So mm. I have a, a kid um, who was well, not really a kid, but he was 16 years old at the time when I met him. And this was 10 years ago. And yeah. he um, was working a job um, to ensure that his mom had, had uh, money at home. So he would go to school and then in the uh, afternoons till evening, he would be working a job. And he had never imagined ever going to university. Oh. Um, today, he's a university graduate. He's working as an accountant and he's, uh, his employer is paying for him to further his certifications in accountancy. And um, the fact that he had the resilience to overcome the situation that he overcame in life mm. is something that continues to inspire me. So no particular like mantra, but it's the real life stories of yeah. um, the difference that uh, kids have made for themselves mm. as a result of being given the opportunity and support. Okay, and final question. If there was one thing that you wanted to say to both students and educators who are watching this video, what would you say to them? Yeah, well, before I say anything to students and educators, I would say that Teach From Malaysia is looking for our 2023 cohort, and we are looking for passionate, amazing young people or just Malaysians who want to make a difference in education. So we'd love for you, for whatever, from whatever background you come from, uh, if you want to make a difference in education, please apply to the Teach From Malaysia Fellowship. Or if you can't spend two years of your life doing that, please um, donate or volunteer with Teach From Malaysia. We'd love all the support that we can get. Um, to students and to teachers, I think that know that, uh, to students first, I think that know that, you know, your dreams and your life is worth, uh, is worth pursuing, right? And that you shouldn't let anybody kind of talk you against that and, and make you believe that you can't achieve what, what you want to be true for yourself. Mm -hmm. And to educators, know that your work is so important, right? That your work makes a difference mm -hmm. and uh, that you deserve the support uh, that you need to be the best possible teacher that you can be for your students. Thank you so much for joining us in conversation today. We've really appreciated all your insights on Malaysian education system. I, for one, have learned a lot. Have you? 27 ringgit. That's so little money. Now we welcome Nadia Izudin, head of Medeka Award Trust, to share more on the program and how it inspires excellence in our Malaysian talents. Nadia, um, you're the head of the Medeka Award Trust. Can you tell us how it came about? Hi, Richard. So the Medica Award was introduced in August 2007, basically to reward amazing, outstanding Malaysian individuals as well as organisations who have contributed immensely to the nation as well as to the people of Malaysia. Mm. Um, so we have two signature programmes. So the first programme is the Medica Award uh, programme, basically, which is to reward outstanding individuals as well as organisations in the five different categories. So we have education and community, we have environment, health science and technology, outstanding scholastic achievement as well as outstanding contribution to the people of Malaysia. Mm. And last year we also introduced a new category which is the Anugrah Harapan Merdeka mm. to reward younger individuals as well as organisations based on the earlier mentioned category. Yeah, so specifically for the grant for international attachment, mm -hmm. what does it aim to do? Yes, so, so the grant is the second signature program that we've introduced, so we only have two. So the grant is to reward younger Malaysians basically, um, individuals mm -hmm. um, who aspire to learn more about whatever it is the project or research that they're doing right now and learn from international institutions, organizations, universities, you name it. So mm. we're giving them an opportunity to further develop their skills mm. and, and build their knowledge basically by leveraging on um, contacts or, or network with other universities or partner host institutions mm -hmm. on whatever project it is that they're working on. Right. Uh, and that international attachment, that grant, is designed to, to give qualified Malaysians, you mm -hmm. know, the chance to go on this three-month stint at a, at a host inti institution. Mm -hmm. Those that have come back, uh, what kind of stories have they come back with? Well, I've heard many, many amazing stories from our grantees, basically. But mm. in a nutshell, I would have to say um, they really appreciate that they are able to network with like some of the um, professors or professionals that they can, they can you know, they wouldn't have the opportunity here. So um, right. it's something once in a lifetime opportunity for them basically mm -hmm. to sort of meet with their idols and, and learn from them and you know, and, and, bring, and they are able to bring back the knowledge here to Malaysia and share it with their peers. So that is the, um, the main comment that we've gotten from, from all of our grantees basically. But of course, it provides other opportunities as well. It provides you a chance to um, 
build your knowledge, build your expertise and network as well and collaborate with other uh, partners or host institutions or universities. Mm, if you had a chance yourself to go on an <laughs> attachment, uh, what would you do and where would you go? I guess if I look back during my school days, I was really into acting. So Ooh. perhaps um, um, somewhere, something about arts or, or, or acting Theater. specific. Yeah, mm. yeah. Perhaps somewhere in NYU, I'm not sure. Ooh. <laughs> Nice. Okay, so uh, if you knew someone who's thinking of applying for the grant uh, but wasn't sure if they stood a chance to get it, what mm -hmm. kind of advice would you give them? What would you tell them? Mm. Well, first of all, if you meet the age criteria, which is you have to be 35 and below to apply and you right. have to be in Malaysia. Apart from that, if you're already working, you must already be working on something, basically. You can't suddenly think of an idea, oh, I want to study forestry, for example, and you know, but it's not something that you've started any, um, or initiated yet. So mm. then you won't be able to get the grant. You have to already be working on the research or project or already working on something with your uh, organization or university. And then um, I guess the second thing is just to just try, basically. We have three main categories mm. for the grant, education and community, mm -hmm. environment, as well as health, science and technology. So for education and community, it's quite um, wide basically the category because it also includes arts, mm. it also includes sports, community, social work, um, you name it. So you can apply for that under that category basically but we also have the, the environment as well as the health science and technology which is what we're mostly known for. Mm. Yeah. So beyond health research, education and environment, we're already covering uh, in, in these episodes, which disciplines do you wish to see more applicants uh, from and, and why? Of course, we appreciate applications from any of the categories I mentioned earlier, but we are looking for more applicants in, in education community, specifically perhaps art, sports, you know, because the misconception about Medica Award is that, you know, it's very health um, academic related. Mm. Right. So it's something that, you know, we want to, um, we want more applicants in those, in those non-sciences, non-academics uh, field so that, mm. you know, it provides a sort of balance in terms of the applicants that we're getting every year. Is there an application period for this? Yes, actually we just launched our grant program on the 1st of January, so applications are open until the 1st of May. Okay. So all you have to do is just head on to the Modeka Award website, okay. www.modekawad.my, and click on the application. Yep. All right. So if you're a Malaysian under the age of, age of 35 years old, who is currently um, studying or doing a research project or is working with an organisation based on education, community, environment or health science and technology, please do read more information about it on the website and please apply. Yeah, what are some of the things that uh, the grant covers? Well, we will cover er all the related costs for them to go for the three-month um, attachment at any institution or university or organisation. Mm -hmm. um, so it covers accommodation, flight, um, transportation, any related study fees that is associated to the attachment. Yeah, so we cover pretty much everything mm -hmm. for you to go um, go to your in dream institution and university or organisation and just learn and bring back the knowledge to Malaysia. Cool. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to go look into it. And if you want to look into it, head down to our podcast description where you'll find all the necessary links to it. And we've also done a couple of other episodes. Um, you can check it out on BFM's YouTube channel. But for now, we're just going to say goodbye. Bye. Bye.